Hello, welcome back to Bebop Review. My name is Andy Shaw. Today I'm just going to talk about the style of Charlie Parker because basically this course is mainly about Charlie Parker because there's been more stuff written on him so I can draw from more information. So I'm just going to go through basically Thomas Owen's summary of Charlie Parker's playing and then what we'll do is in later episodes we'll concentrate on, on certain things that he's been saying. So the first thing that Thomas Owen says is that Charlie Parker always plays in duplex time. That is 44022. And I think that's pretty much, I think everybody will agree with that. I've never seen Charlie Parker play a 3 4 tune or any other tune. In fact, in jazz, most jazz at that period in 1940 was played in 4 4 anyway. I mean, uh, different types of of time signatures didn't really come into common practice until uh, Brubeck's classic Time Out album in the, in late on in the 50s. And then there were obviously a lot more. I mean, nowadays you get all sorts of, of stuff, you know, and in, in, in get key signatures now with a change in key every few, few beats, you know, going 4, 4, 3, 4, whatever. So, uh, so that's the first thing, that Charlie Parker's music is always 4, 4. So if you want to play authentic bebop, you've got to play in 4, 4 time, okay? Uh, the next thing he says is about Charlie Parker's tempos. Charlie Parker's tempos vary with great extremity from 60 beats a minute, which is his slowest, which is pieces like meandering and out of nowhere. They're very slow pieces to extreme speeds, uh, which is in excess of 400 beats a minute. Quarter, that's quarter note over 400 beats a minute. Uh, pieces like uh, 22nd Street theme that was there's some live versions of that over 400 beats a minute also I've also seen that Charlie Parker sometimes quotes people like Jimmy Dorsey uh, at extreme t uh, tempos but on slow tunes so he might take a tune like All the Things You Are but he'll play a little bit of Jimmy Dorsey but actually play even faster than Jimmy Dorsey was considered to be a real virtuoso at that time you know in 19 from 1920s up 40s onwards although Dorsey was doing more novelty type tunes when he was playing with his big band Jimmy Dorsey was like playing these novelty things that were really fast but Parker kind of in in one of them which he did which was recorded with Dean Bonetti Parker plays uh, not a double time run but like a four four times speed run and it was way over 400 if you took those eighth notes and put them into quarter notes it's way over 400 nearly 500 beats a minute, just very briefly. But he actually quotes a piece of uh, Jimmy Dorsey's Oodles of Noodles, which is itself a very fast piece, about 380, close to 400 beats a minute. And Parker goes way in excess of that, nearly 500 beats a minute. It was amazing. Only reason I got it was by slowing the record right down and then like counting the beats out. So Parker, extreme, extreme ranges. Slowest, slowest tempos, not unique in jazz. But upper tempos, over 400 beats a minute, absolutely nobody could match him at that time, really, apart from probably Dizzy and a few others. But it was really well above what jazz musicians at that time could actually play. So it was way above, beyond most of those. Uh, most of Parker's tempos, though, are between the ranges of 125 beats a minute and 250 beats a minute. So if you look at most of Parker's tunes, you'll actually find that, which is pretty average for, for most jazz musicians at that time. So... That's so he could play with people. Because <laughs> if you've got any Charlie Park, most of Charlie Parker records, which like I've got, you find him that he plays with just about everything: swing musicians, bebop musicians, you know. So, uh, so he needs to be, he needs to be able to, you know, uh, be able to play in lots of different styles and stuff. In fact, that's one of the great things about uh, about Charlie Parker that he could play in, in like with different styles of musicians, you know. Uh, Parker's note values, right, his, his note values are really uh, at fast tempos, like 200 beats and above. Parker's note values are nearly always eighth notes. This is the American terminology I'm using, eighth notes, which is in Britain would be a called a quaver, obviously. Uh, so he's, he's using eighth notes at tempos that are above 200 beats a minute, but they're not played i'll just put things over the top of this what i'm speaking they're not some of them are not played absolutely evenly the some of them are played evenly if the tempo goes really fast the eighth notes are very even but if the tempo is not super fast the 
the eighth notes appear to be like triplets where you, you get an eighth notes and a, an eighth note, uh, sorry, a triplet note, right, eighth note, then a triplet rest and then another triplet. So it's ba da ba -dee, like that kind of stuff. You'll see that mainly on blues, but also in some faster tunes. He's just really good at articulating these different rhythms. I don't know how he does it, to tell you the truth. Uh, at moderate tempos, that's 125 beats a minute to 200 beat minutes, eighth note phrases are, and sixteenth note phrases are intermingled in various varying proportions, okay? And thirty second note phrases are intermingled, right? This is at slower tempos. His skill in playing many notes per second and organizing them into coherent and interesting phrases was considered extraordinary in the 1940s, for few men could equal him in this regard, so says Thomas Owen. Okay. On syncopation, Parker's improvised melodies commonly contain many syncopations. Some are produced, as might be expected, by uneven time values and by placing short accented notes between beats but most are produced by accentuation of individual notes, especially the high notes of the moment within constant stream of eighth notes. So as the eighth note's going along, you might get an I note that Parker might jump onto. When he jumps up to that note, he'll hit it hard. You know what I mean? You know, that kind of stuff. Really, high notes are hit, hit, hit hard. High notes are hit hard, okay? Articulation. Now this is interesting because I actually criticised Rick Beato. Can you remember in that, that video I did about Rick Beato where Rick Beato was accenting notes off the beat where he's going ba bi do ba di ba di ba da like that. We don't actually hear Parker play like that, but he does accent notes like that, mainly eighth notes. Eighth note articulation is off the beat like that. So you play a quaver down or an eighth note down and then you accent, accent it off the beat. So it goes ba da ba da ba da, just like Rick Beato did. The thing is, Parker doesn't play that rhythm constantly. He might just do that, you know, with it just twice, bad -e -ba and they'll go straight beat, accent on the beat. So you get much more variation in accents with Charlie Parker, and you're also getting jumping around all over the place, which, uh, which uh, changes the actual syncopation. But the, uh, the articulation is, is similar to to what Ribiato was showing you when I criticised him. It's, it does play off the beat, but it's like even, I'll actually put over the top and show you what uh, what happens. But you get even notes off the beat, but you also get these triplet type notes off the beat, whereas Parker's like putting a little, little rest in between the triplets. So it's badi, badi, like that. It's more it's more like that, but it's, Parker does it, uh, you've got to listen to weird Parker. I'll actually play a bit of Parker's playing over the top so you can actually hear it better. But Parker, the way he accents these notes and plays it, it's, it's completely unique, actually. Melody. Parker's melodic vocabulary is based on the major minor modal system embellished by a liberal amount of chromatism stemming from passing a neighbour motion, implied secondary dominance and modal borrowing, major minor and phrygian. Now I'm not, I, I don't quite agree with Thomas Owen on this. Thomas Owen says, if you got like a G7 chord, now you'd normally play a mixolydian, wouldn't you? Which would be like a major scale from a modal point of view, right? And he's saying that what you would do is you would play the Phrygian version of that. So the Phrygian version of G would be E, wouldn't it? E Phrygian. You've got an E, F, G. It's the third, it's, G is the third mode. So 
it would be going E, E, uh, sorry, not E, E flat. It would be E flat, F, G, A flat. So the A flat would be the flat nine on the Phrygian, right? But I actually, and there are lots of people over, all over YouTube say exactly the same thing. Rick Beato does a, a guy called, uh, I forgot what his name is now, Sh Schumacher or something, a, a saxophone player. He, always, he says exactly the same things. But I think, I think it's different that. It's not quite as they say it is. And I'm going to be explaining that in, in the video on uh, the Levin and Wilson controversy. In the Levin and Wilson controversy, Charlie, Charlie Parker talks about how he first came to, to realise bebop, <coughs> i.e. he says that we, played, we, could play major, we could play major trads on a seventh chord using the right inversion. And he also said other things to Leonard Feather. If you put them together, you can get, either get, you can get an idea of how bebop scales came about. And I'll explain in this in the Levin Wilson controversy when we get to it. But what I'm saying is that this flat nine on a seventh chord, I think it's actually parts of the harmonics on the chords. And it doesn't actually belong to the seventh chord. It's an harmonic that belongs on the major chord, which is kind of like Parker's shifting beats and bringing it across. But I'll talk about it and you can, you can accept what I say or dismiss it, you know. But it's just something to think about anyway. So that's one thing. Uh, but I agree with, with uh, Owen that... Uh, Parker's scale choices are major and minor, definitely. Harmony. The chords, com the chords implied by Parker's melodies are the triads and sevens that form the basis of the common practice harmonic vocabulary. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Plus a variety of nines, elevenths and thirteenths chords and triads with added sixes. Right? So what we're saying is that Parker basically plays chords, but you did normal extensions. The normal extensions is what you'd learn if you went to a college, you know what I mean? You, you put cut chords, you, you find out where the key is. This is why it's really important to put a key signature when you're studying Parker, right? Then you check out what the relationship of the key, chord is to the key and then what the, what, the, uh, what the tensions are, right? The extension of the chord, the tensions are in relation to that key, right? But there's another thing that, that don't quite work out that is, is, that is exactly what happens. No problem with that. I've got no problem with that. That's what, what you can actually say. But Parker brings in chromatism, and I don't think it's got anything to do with extensions to chords, even though people on YouTube have been saying it has. I think it's got something to do with the harmonics, i.e. these harmonics that, are, that appear on chords, right, which form the bebop scales. I believe that they actually form the bebop scales, and Parker's bringing these in, right? And that's what some of these extensions are, right? What you see as extensions anyway. Because when you look at them, they don't seem to make sense in, in the way you learn how to work tensions out. But they, they are there as well. I know a lot of people will be finding this difficult to understand what I'm actually saying because it is a unique way of looking at it and nobody else is actually looking at it, right? But if you watch the Lennon-Wilson controversy as that goes on, you will actually understand this better, right? Without any problems. So, so Parker's melodic voices are from, are definitely from the extensions of chords, which I agree with. But also Parker brings in this chromatism, which is kind of like bebop scale type things, uh, where he, mainly where he changes the music and keeps voice line, voice leading lines going. Like I say, we'll talk about this uh, more. I can't. All I'm doing now is just summarising uh, the same thing that. Uh, Tommy Soinders. I'm basically going through his summarization. Okay. Right, so Parker's tone quality, right? This is another thing that's quite interesting. Parker's tone quality is harsh for an alto saxophone player at that time. When you think about who were playing, you know, Benny Carter and Willie Smith and Johnny Hodges, all these people, you know, and even Jimmy Doze, although Jimmy Doze got a very clean, clean uh, way of playing. But Parker's sound is very harsh, harsh, and it would put it actually put a lot of people off in the 1940s. I know Art Pepper, when I was reading his book called Straight Life, I don't know if you've read that, but it's a really good book if you haven't. Uh, Art Pepper couldn't stand Parker; he just hated him because he couldn't stand his sound. He thought he had such a harsh sound, you know, like devoid of pity, as uh, Stanley Crouch says. 
Uh, but uh, obviously later on, uh, Art Pepper actually got into poker and loved his playing. Uh, but at that time, he ate it, and a lot of people did. But when you think about Parker's sound in relation to bebop, it's absolutely perfect. It's the perfect sound for that way of playing, isn't it? So, so it's something, something that you have to also consider when you're playing bebop, right? Parker's sound is harsh because his sound emphasizes high harmonics of, of, the, of his tone. Instruments always all sound different, right? Because you've got a fundamental tone and then the harmonics are all different. A, gu a guitar sounds different to a saxophone because the harmonics are sounding different. A clarinet sounds different to a saxophone because the harmonics are different. On a clarinet, the, the harmonics, have, if you could see the loudness of each harmonic, as you see, you play the note C, then the note above that C, which would be another note, would be, would be minimum sound on a... On a Clarinet, but then the next one would be louder. The next one would be a G, which would be louder still. The next harmonic, and it goes like that it goes loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft. And that's what gives a clarinetic sound. It's the conical bore of a clarinet, it's absolutely conical. But on a saxophone, the bore it's not conical, so it's rounded, it's like cylindrical. A, a clarinet, but a saxophone is conical, it starts off narrow and then gets wider. A saxophone, doesn't it? And that conical sound makes all the harmonics sound loud. So you play the fundamental notes and the other notes above that are all, are all very loud too and that gives it its unique sound. Now Charlie Parker, if you compare Charlie Parker's sound to Johnny Hodges' sound, Johnny Hodges' sound right, would have a very loud fundamental and then still loud harmonics but less loud, right? Charlie Parker's sound is fundamental, wouldn't be quite as loud but the harmonics would be louder, if you know what I mean, very very rich in harmonics going right up higher and that's the sound that you really need want to be getting if you're going to play bebop because that's the style of bebop really it's playing a sound with higher harmonics and you get that by you know on the saxophone you get it by mouthpiece and read and experimenting also just by listening to park you you end up playing in that kind of high level if you listen to somebody like uh, what's his name that that uh, pop thing what's his hold on let me think of what, he's, what they call him kenny g if you're playing something like kenny g then you've got to listen to kenny g and play that which isn't hot uh, his sound isn't based on higher harmonics it's something completely different isn't it uh, but if you want to play like that you've got to listen to kenny g and get that kind of sound although i can't stand anybody who'd want to play like that okay so that's discussion of parker's tone quality vibrato parker Right, complete, completely different to other saxophone players at that time, right, apart from probably Lester Young and uh, white saxophone player, Lester Young, Jimmy Dozier and Frankie Trombor. He plays with very narrow vibrato, right? It's, uh, its range is only 120 cent if you were actually measuring it on a tuning scale and it's very slow. His vibrato runs at five five times a second, which was slow at that time. Because I always call the, the the vibrato before Parker nanny goat vibrato, and you can hear it very clearly if you listen to the jazz at the Philharmonic. Willie Smith played a very early one, 1946, when Parker first went on those tunes. You listen to Willie Smith who was there and playing. His his vibrato is very wide and. You know, it's like nanny goat. I always call it nanny goat vibrato. I'm not, although I'm not criticising Willie Smith because I think he's a great player. But you listen straight away to Charlie Parker, and from our from our our ears today, sorry, I'm knocking my mic. From our ears today, Parker's sound is very modern, very modern. It sounds that's how we play today. You know what I mean? When you listen to him compared to the guys on the uh, jazz at the Philharmonic, you know. Right, the mode of Parker's pieces that is the keys what Parker plays and well Charlie Parker plays nearly always in the major tonality that means he always plays in major keys in fact 95% of all these all everything he ever recorded is in a major key probably more than that actually uh, and only a few in a minor key which is places like uh, oh, the bird that's in a minor key it's a lovely tune actually that the bird uh, and Night in Tunisia you know some 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 pieces that other people wrote. 
uh, but most of it is in a major key. So like I say, if you're playing authentic bebop, you would have played in a major key, not a minor key. Although I'm not saying don't play in a minor key. You know, I'm just saying that's that's really what you want to be concentrating on when you practice and, th and things. Right, choice of keys, right? A lot of people say Charlie Parker played in every key and all this kind of stuff. Uh, he probably practiced, I think Charlie Parker practiced his patterns in every key. But I don't think he practiced tunes in every key. I don't. I, I don't think he did that. I think a, a lot of time he just he could just play it. I think you know he just hear some at once and play because he played a lot of stuff by ear. Uh, but the keys he played in are in, this is in concert pitch B flat that would be G in alto sax, F which would be D in alto sax, and C major which would be A in in uh, alto sax. And that that accounts for sixty five percent of everything he ever played. So three keys. You know more than half of everything they played other keys he used were in concert d flat a flat e flat g and d major and e flat b flats f c d and a minor all right so in, in my in the minor key he played e flat b flat f c d and a minor okay i'll write all this down so if you want to make notes you can do although like i said i'm all i'm doing is quoting Thomas Owen. So uh, if you look through uh, Thomas Owen stuff, you'll actually see what I'm talking about. So I'm just I'm just talking about it. Get you get you interested in in talking about this thing, thinking about this thing. Okay. Charlie Parker's repertoire. Right. Parker recorded about 300 different pieces. Right. His favourite pieces were obviously based on 12 bar blues. If you look in the Charlie Parker Omni book, you see a hell of a lot of 12 bar blues, don't you? Uh, and that accounts for about 20% of all the recordings that were ever made of Charlie Parker. And also pieces based on 32 measure tunes. Uh, most popular one was I Got Rhythm, which accounts for 15% of all, all his recordings. Nearly all the remaining repertoire consists of 32 measure pieces, right, in AABA -A -A pattern or AABA -A prime or ABAC. Okay, forms. Uh, and 64 measure tunes, obviously pieces like 64 measure tunes, pieces like Coco, right, in AABA -A form, and other forms like AA, prime, BA, double prime <laughs> forms. Okay? Except in a handful of cases, Parker's solos appear to have been composed spontaneously rather than in advance. In his early days, when he was playing with Jamie McShane, Parker was actually composing his solos. You can tell this because there's actually recordings, recordings of the same, so you know, the same tune from different areas. You know what I mean? He might be at one studio one week, and he'll play it on. He might be live, and you will find out that the solos are very, very similar. So he's obviously pre-composed a lot of, a lot of his stuff. But later on, from like 19. Well, from we we got the re the mature Parker, which appeared in 1944 on the Red Cross Romance Art finance session with uh, Tiny Grimes. Parker Parker's solos were completely improvised, right, and spontaneously improvised. Although he was playing big patterns, if you look at Red Cross takes one and great take two of Red Cross, you see really big pieces of pre-composed music you know what i mean they're very similar in areas there's only slightly bits that are out so a lot of parker's tunes were pre-composed but as we go on through the 1940s parker was so adept at playing i got the rhythm he could play it backwards virtually that all the solos are different but you still get these pre-composed riffs you know these patterns which we're going to be talking about in this series from now on because this is just an introduction to the to the patterns uh, and and different stuff uh, so so that's the main thing. So initially it was, it was uh, pre-composing, but then it become more spontaneous, but it was always using these patterns that we were putting about. Now these patterns is about 100 motives of these patterns that Parker could put together in varying lengths, modifying them and combining them in a great variety of ways. Consequently, consequently, his solos are organized without reference to the theme of the piece being performed. So even though People like uh, that Martin character who, who did the whole thing saying Parker's playing is based on themes. 
you don't actually see that evidence, especially in the fast tunes. In fact, most of the themes aren't even themes. I mean, Kim isn't really a tune. It's an, an improvised, the actual tune is an improvised idea. It's just something obviously that come to him at the moment and he just played it, you know, as a theme, but it's, it's not really a, 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 a proper composition like Yardbird Suite. Yardbird Suite's a proper composition and Moose the Mooch, which is a proper composition. Things like Kim, Clunder Stan and all these types of things and laid bed and whatever they're just improvised themes you know they're like you could call it head theme you know what i mean just playing a, a header uh the rhythm section just starts playing and then parker just plays a theme straight out of his head you know so but they're all based around these motives everything whether they're composed or not composed they're all based around these motives of varying lengths which parker has about 100 of them in his repertoire from 1944 to 45, Parker's improvisation underwent no substantial change. So if you listen to Charlie Parker in 1944, you listen to him in 55, you can tell it's Charlie Parker. There's no big, big change in the, in the way he plays. Although he does play, brings in some more uh, rare emotives in his later play. His improvisation is not influenced by the background. So Parker can play with swing musicians or bebop musicians. His solos are pretty much the same. He can, as he can, for some reason he can play, no matter what the background is. That you know, his drummer's playing bang, 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 straight like that, or you know, like like Max Roach or whatever. He can still improvise over that in the same way. He, he puts the accents in where he wants to put the accents in so the music is still bebop even though the rhythm background rhythm might be different whether the piano player is playing stride as uh, we got with uh, Nat King Cole in 1946 when they played Cherokee you had this very stridey piano from Nat King Cole but Box just played absolutely brilliantly over Cherokee putting accents and rhythm in and you know what I mean it's, it, the, the background is just basically something that's that's a solid thing that's going across and Parker's just freely playing around it. It's amazing actually isn't it, to listen to. Parker's style on is in his improvisation also changes where he is. When Charlie Parker plays in the studio, he very rarely quotes, although sometimes he does quote, sometimes brilliantly, uh, puts quotes in, but it's very liberal. I mean he's a lovely quote on uh, Lover Man from the 1950 version of Lover Man, or 51 version of Lover Man, where Parker puts in a quote from Mean to Me. Mean to me, why aren't you so mean to me? He, he puts that in on the Lover Man. It, it flows in really nicely, but you can't, it's almost like you can't spot it because it's just so really nicely put in. But when Parker goes into the live situation, especially if you've got the Dean Bonetti albums, Parker's playing quotes i mean there's one on all the things you are where parker's actually quoting masses of tunes so i mean the whole first 16 bar there just seems to be masses of quotes in but they, they disguise but it's brilliant how he actually puts them all together so the solo is still telling a story it's one of his best versions of all the things you are which uh, dean benete uh, dean benedette actually recorded and it's just amazing to listen to all those quotes that he puts on. But you don't get that in the live version. So Parker's playing uh, live. Sorry, you don't get that in the studio version. In the live version, there's much more quotes than there is in the studio. Parker's solos, according to Thomas Owen, are influenced by three main factors. One is the tempo. So that, that determines whether he's going to be playing these even eighth notes or masses of sixteenth note. Obviously, as the tempo goes down, Parker's playing masses and masses of sixteenth notes. In fact, so, some, the, the, the actual tunes are so complex at slow tunes that they're very, very difficult to write down in music terms because the rhythm is so complicated. Parker's playing all sorts. Not only that is, but he's accenting all over the place as well, which is quite difficult. You've got to really listen, list slow a record down and really listen to it to, to get that. So tempo does affect that. Uh, the key obviously affects his playing because in certain keys, Parker uses certain patterns in certain keys. He's got the, like his favourite things. It's like if you listen to something, uh, if you listen to something like. 
I got rhythm, which is in the key of B flat or G on alto sax, and then compare that to confirmation, anything in, uh, I, on I got rhythm, B flat to confirmation, which is another key, you, you see that there's a, a difference in the way the solo is constructed, and also in minor keys. I mean, if you listen to the bird, which is in the minor key, I, it's, it's, you don't hear Parker play nothing like that on anything else. It's, it's really interesting, that one. Uh, and also the harmonic structure uh, affects his playing as well, how, it, how, how the chord structure is going. The slow pieces are extremely florid, as uh, observes Thomas Owen, the, and rhythmically complicated, which I've just said. Uh, the moderate and fast paces are usually simple, that is the eighth notes become it more even. His use of motives changes from one key to the, to the next key. For example, uh, Thomas Owen says, his typical melodies right, for the blues in C major are not simply transpositionals of his favourite melodies for the blues. So if you get a blues like in B flat, right, and Parker's playing all these riffs, you know, which, which we actually hear quite a lot, right, or D, I mean, and then he switches to another key, you don't actually start hearing those, you don't start hearing those melodies again. You know those little riffs that he played in that key, it'll be a completely set of new little riffs. <laughs> you get what I mean? Uh, and not, they're not simple transpositions. They don't transpose riffs from one key, key to another. Now you hear a lot of people on YouTube they, they gear a Charlie Parker riff, don't they? Have a look. They do. They gear a Charlie Parker riff. And then they say, transpose it into all keys. Transpose that riff into all keys and make it part of your, your personality or whatever. You know, Charlie Parker doesn't play like that. He's, he plays certain riffs and, and certain patterns in certain keys. You can listen to a tune in a certain key, right? And you can hear those riffs. And then you will listen to a blues or whatever in another key, right? And you will not hear those blues, those same blues. So I want to tell you that now, you've got to be very careful with people on YouTube who are saying, transpose everything to different keys. Charlie Parker did not do that. And Thomas Owen observed that and said, that's what, he doesn't do that, okay. Owen says, regardless of the variations from one solo to the next, one group of solos to the next, and one key to the next, there's a basic organizing device linking the great majority of Parker's improvisations descending scale passages. Now, I actually want to talk a little bit about this descending scale passages. If any of you have done any arranging, when you arrange music, you find out that as you're arranging, the way that this is in functional harmony, I'm talking about, you know, with like uh, subdominant, dominant tonic music as it goes through those, those, uh, those tonalities, right? As the music goes, goes through, and people, who, if you're arranging music, you find out that as, if you're arranging voice lean lines from one to other, or part right, if you're British, right, as you, as you move it from one to the other, the harmony goes down. You end up getting the, the lines going down, right? So if you're kind of like playing, if you're kind of like arranging music for a saxophone section, a big bang, you find out that you, you're playing the music going down. See, this is our tune called the Blues Machine. And we've got all these uh, these harmonies, right, for saxophone. We've got baritone sax here, trumpet and trombone. But if you look there at the saxophone line, can you see how the harmony is moving down? Every time we block the harmony, we're going lower and lower and lower. Right, because it's natural for harmony to go down. It's just a natural thing. It seems to want to fall, right? Uh, or if you don't believe me, have a go at arranging it. Uh, try and arrange some, some saxophone music and just try and arrange like simple lines through the thing you'll see the music goes down now Parker's playing his improvisation solos works like that all Parker's lines are descending voicely and descending now Parker might be jumping about all over the place right you get people saying oh Charlie Parker jumps up and he does all this kind of stuff but the basic line the voice leading line is always descending like that it descends until we hit something called M1, nearly always M1, which is like an arpeggiator thing, which takes the line back up, and then it starts going down again. Now, as it's going down, it's moving about all over, and you can't actually hear that. And if you've heard, listened to a lot of Charlie Parker, 
and you actually know what to listen to because I can hear it because I've, I've heard that much Charlie Parker stuff anyway and I know it's there you, you might miss it out but it's definitely there this voicing line that goes down and, and according to Thomas Owen that's that's one of the main things that distinguish Charlie Parker from all of the other jazz musicians of his period nobody else had this descending voice leading line that went down in fact when you start looking at Charlie Parker's voice leading line it's absolutely incredible you know the actual way he put them together it's almost like his solos are composed but they're not <laughs> they're not because you see you see him play the same same solo or same over same tune again and you get another completely different solo but again this brilliant voice leading line that goes down so it's amazing so that's an important thing descending scale passages Owen then goes on to say to understand Parker's art is to understand a great deal of the art of jazz in the first place Parker was thoroughly grounded in the jazz tradition in if you remember from the Levin Wilson Charlie Parker says he got in that interview Charlie Parker says he wasn't influenced by anybody but uh, Cole Wardek in his book, uh, Charlie Parker's Life and Legacy, shows that Charlie Parker was basically ripping everybody off. You can find out loads of different musicians in Parker's uh, in Parker's uh, solos. You know what I mean? You get a bit of Louis Armstrong, a bit of Jimmy Dawes, a lot of Lester Young, you know, Roy Eldridge, everybody. So, uh, so he actually was very much into jazz players and that. And he really knew ja knew his jazz. So he he. He drew from the jazz tradition, if you know. He, he drew from the jazz tradition all the time. So he, was, he, he could play with all different kind of musicians because he'd listened to them and he absorbed it all when he was younger. Some elements of his style are also part of older musician styles. But most importantly, he was the most influential player in jazz during the last 10 years of his life. The musicians who imitated aspects of his syncopations, articulations, tone quality and repertoire of motifs are legion. Yep, you got, you got, got to think about any old saxophone player in the 1940s, and they all played, tried to play like Charlie Parker, apart from some of the white players like Paul Desmond, Lee Konitz, and Art Pepper. Just about everybody else were playing, trying to play like Charlie Parker. You know, you, you listen, you think about people like Sonny Stick, which is, he's very close to Charlie Parker, and Lou Donaldson, and Phil Woods, and. Just loads, you know, uh, Jackie McLean, uh, just alto players, just absolutely all, all trying to play similar to Charlie Parker. Okay, but what I've just been saying about Parker's style is pretty unique to him. Although most people would copy him, didn't actually get put everything together like Charlie Parker. A lot, more, a lot of it was the accent; they couldn't accent as quick, quick as Charlie Parker. You know the interesting accenting uh, but they sounded similar to Charlie Parker but not exactly if you listen to Charlie Parker then listen to them you can tell the difference straight away even though people are saying that they're clones they're not nobody really become a clone of Charlie Parker those people who did copy Charlie Parker and they were playing like him never really got to play like him and they and them themselves ended up producing their own styles so they ended up becoming unique individuals in their own right also, uh, Owen says, is that the motives of Charlie Parker actually came, a lot of them came before the bebop era, so they were actually, the, they were actually around during the preceding era, i.e. the swing era and before that. Uh, Parker played, what it is, is a lot of those motives that Charlie Parker played, I mean, uh, like M1, which is just an arpeggio going up, I mean, it's been around since, you know, Early, you know, Renaissance music, European Renaissance music. But the thing is, the other players didn't play him like Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker played him in these unique ways by, you know, uh, putting chromatism in and always using them in this high rise for voice leading lines and that, and within voice leading lines. So it's even though all these riffs and patterns, you, you'll see them somewhere else. They weren't actually played the same way as Charlie Parker. That's why you've got to listen to his music. And it, the way he puts them all together, all these things, is one of the distinguishing factors of Charlie Parker. Uh, so I think that's about it on the introduction to Parker's style. I'll, I'll try and edit this and put it. I'm just talking to, to myself here at the moment in front of the window. I bet people at flats across there think I'm a bit of a nutter, actually. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll uh, 
we'll elaborate on these. We'll start off with Moses and we'll just talk about it. Again, it's time we've got time to put all this stuff together. And I want to be, I want to be cycling around all these other things I've got. You know, the Barry Harris uh, thing. So we've got I believe uh, Barry Harris and uh, Levin Wilson, which is quite interesting, and the harmony as well. We need to be getting into the harmony a bit more as well. So it's just uh, it's just getting time to put these videos on. Okay, so uh, so I'll leave that for today uh, and. I'll see you in the next video, okay? Bye.